Ronnie Chapman with the Dover Church of Christ. I'm visiting in the area with the Wadsworth Church of Christ in a gospel meeting. Today, I'd like for us to discuss a dividing lines. When we were young, we used to go to the beach or maybe by the shore somewhere uh, along a river or a lake, and uh, there would be sand, and we'd play in the sand. And you, you know that a lot of times people will draw a line in the sand, as our first slide suggests. People draw lines in the, in the sand uh, to distinguish themselves from others or over some issue. And many times those issues are just silly and nonsensical. Unfortunately, people do that in the church as well. And people divide over some of the strangest things. Division is not what God always wants. And yet sometimes it's necessary. And just as sometimes people have to draw a line and say you can't cross that line, God also draws lines. And that's surprising to some people, the fact that God would draw a line and say don't cross it. But when you stop and think about it, anything that is beyond God's line, we would refer to as sin. And so we have to understand that. There are times when God says when you're on one side of a line, then that's wrong. But if I can get you to cross over to the other side of the line, then you're right. And that line is a demarcation between right and wrong or between one state and another state. I grew up in West Virginia. I now live in Ohio. And there is a line, a boundary line, that I cross going from one state to the other. Well, the same is true in spiritual matters as well. There have been times when God looked upon a situation and said, this is bad and there's got to be a line drawn. And once that line is crossed, then things will be what they should be again. Those lines of demarcation are what I want us to consider today. I want us to look back in the history of the Bible and look at some instances when God said this person was in the wrong or the situation or the state was bad, and then it moved to something new. And what was the line that declared that difference? The first one, as we see on our slide, it involves Noah. The dividing line uh, was no, for Noah's ark, uh, was rather Noah's ark. In 1 Peter 2, or rather 2 Peter 2 and verse 5, Peter said that God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. God had created the world, but it had become very evil. And when we get to Genesis chapter 6, we find that God looked down upon the earth and he was displeased with his creation even to the point that he was sorry that he had created man because their every thought of their mind was continually evil. All that man could think about was the wrong thing, evil thoughts. And so God decided that he was going to destroy the earth. But there was one man who stood out that was different from the rest of the world, and his name was Noah. And so Noah, uh, God appeared to Noah, and they talked to him and said, I'm going to spare you, your wife, your three sons, and their wives. But here's what you have to do. You have to build an ark, a large boat. I want you to gather all the animals uh, two by two, except for the uh, clean. And there would be groups of seven. And then what I want you to do, get on that ark, and I will cause a flood to come upon the earth. And what will separate you from those people who will be destroyed, uh, from those who are safe in the ark, are the floodwaters. So God spent, uh, sent the flood to destroy the world. What a sad occasion for God. I can only imagine uh, the, the sorrow in heaven to see all the beautiful things that God had created being destroyed by this flood because of man's sins. But God did save mankind, and he saved animal life by the use of the flood. When Noah and his family and the animals boarded the ark, the rain fell for 40 days and for 40 nights. Those who had 
not paid any attention to the preaching of Noah were destroyed. The earth was flooded. Man was spared only through God's grace upon Noah and his family. What was the demarcation line in that instance? What separated the people? In actuality, it was the water, the floodwaters. The floodwaters came, they lifted the ark, and carried Noah and his family to safety. But that same water destroyed those people who were living in evil and unrighteousness. The line was water, and it separated the two groups of people. God used water in that instance as a line of demarcation. God had shut them in the ark, and Peter says in 1 Peter 3 and verse 20 that those eight souls that were saved were form who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. And so that water became a line of demarcation between those who were destroyed and those who were spared. The second of our slides shows us another line of demarcation. The dividing line for Israel was the Red Sea. Of course, you recall that Abraham, uh, Abraham's descendants eventually ended up in Egypt. Jacob uh, and his sons moved down to be in the land of Goshen uh, when Joseph had found favor in the sight of Pharaoh and was ruling in Pharaoh's place basically over the whole land. But as time passed by, the Pharaoh who loved and appreciated Joseph died and another Pharaoh rose, and he did not recognize the wonder of the children of Israel. And so he decided to make them into slaves. He was fearful that they would come, and uh, if an enemy came into the land, that they would uh, join with the enemy to overthrow Pharaoh or to escape. And so he made slaves of them and used them in slave labor. But they cried to God, and God decided that he was going to spare them. And he was going to use his servant Moses to save them. And we realize that Moses was one of the children that should have been killed under Pharaoh's direction, but was spared by his mother and found in the waters in a little ark by Pharaoh's daughter, brought into uh, his mother's home for a while. And then after he was weaned, went to live with Pharaoh in Pharaoh's palace under uh, Pharaoh's daughter. Eventually Moses grew up and he had to flee the land because he had made a decision to side with God's people and that was forced when he had uh, killed a man, uh, uh, an Egyptian. But God called Moses to come back and to bring the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage and to carry them to the promised land. Moses at first balked at doing this, and he made excuses, but God would not accept no for an answer, and Moses went back, talked with the children of Israel, and faced down Pharaoh. Pharaoh did not want to let these children of God go, and he just said, who is God that I should hear his voice? And so God sent plagues, and you'll recall there were 10 of those plagues, and each plague just seemed to be worse, and actually the plagues were of such a nature that they showed that the God of heaven was the supreme being and that the gods of the Egyptians were really just idols. And so these, these, uh, these gods uh, could not help the Egyptians, and Pharaoh became wishy-washy, and he would say, I'll let you go, but only the men can go, or you have to leave your animals here so you'll come back. But eventually God sent the plague of the loss of the firstborn son. Pharaoh lost his own son, and he let the children of Israel go. And as they were leaving the land that same night, Pharaoh decided to change his mind that next day and left after them. Well, the children of Israel, as they had marched out of Egypt, came to the Red Sea. 
And so they faced the Red Sea, and behind them was coming Pharaoh's army. So God told the children of Israel, who were beginning to murmur, just watch what I'm going to do. Moses raised his staff. The Red Sea parted. The winds blew the sea apart. The children of Israel, by faith, stepped into that floor of the, of the Red Sea, marched across dry land to the other side, to the peninsula. And then they turned and watched, and here came Pharaoh's army. And it seemed to them that Pharaoh was going to come and, and force them back into slavery. But God, who had created the wind that separated the seas, also caused the seas to come back together and to drown Pharaoh and his army, to destroy them, and to allow the children of Israel to be free. That's a wonderful story. We share that with our kids. But there's a great lesson in that for us because what was the difference? What stood between the children of Israel and Pharaoh's army was the Red Sea. It was the Red Sea being blown apart and them walking across the dry bed of that sea that spared them and the waters collapsing upon Pharaoh and his army that destroyed them. Again, we find a line of demarcation, the Red Sea, and it separated those who were spared from those who were destroyed. In our next slide, we can see that there was a dividing line for a man uh, in the Syrian army named Naaman, and that dividing line was the Jordan River. Naaman was the captain of the Syrian army. He was a man who was good in many ways. As a matter of fact, in 2 Kings 5 and verse 1, we find this description from the New American Standard Version. Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master and highly received and respected because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man was also a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. Naaman was a leper. Leprosy was a dreaded disease, still is. It just cut you off from everyone. It was debilitating. He would love to have been free from it. And by a handmaiden, an Israelite handmaiden, he found out that there may be someone back in the land of Israel that could save him. And he went to the king, and the king sent to the king of Israel and said, we want our, our man to be freed from this. So we want you to come, and we want you to be able to send him over. We want you to cleanse him of this leprosy. And the king of Israel said, who does he think I am? I am not God that I can cleanse a man of leprosy. And so he sent the king's messenger back with a no. But Elisha heard the, that message. And he sent and said, we can do this. We can. There is a man. We want them to know the God of Israel is the God. And so the message was sent for Naaman to come back to Israel so that he could be cleansed. And he came. He thought, surely this man of God will come back and come out and do some wonderful thing and cause me to be free, cleansed. But that wasn't what was happening. He was simply given a message to go and to dip himself seven times in the Jordan River. He was indignant. He was more than indignant. He was filled with wrath and anger. He was so mad, he said, what is this muddy, dirty, crooked Jordan River? Well, the rivers of Anna and, and Farpar, much greater rivers back in my country. Why can't I go there? And he was just going to storm off in anger. But his servants reasoned with him and said, if the prophet said to do some hard or great difficult thing, would you not have done it? Why not at least do what he said? So Naaman succumbed to that request. And he went and he dipped <clears throat> seven times in the Jordan River. Now the first time he dipped, he wasn't any different than he was before. The second, third, fourth, it just repeated. But the seventh time, when he came up out of the river, his skin was cleansed. He was freed from the dreaded curse of leprosy. 
Why? Was it because of the healing hand of God? Was it because he was able to dip seven times? It was not what he did so much. It was the power of God that did this. But God had drawn a line. And he said, if you do this, you can be cleansed. But if you do not do that, you won't be cleansed. And not until it was completed, not, not the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth dippings, but the last one. That was when it worked. That was when God healed him and cleansed him. And so for him, that old dirty, muddy, crooked Jordan River became the line of demarcation between being uh, terrified by the leprosy that he woke with every morning to being cleansed and freed from it. As we go to the next slide, we see that there was a pool of Siloam that became a dividing line for, of God for a blind man. <clears throat> In John chapter 9, the first three verses, we find these words from the beloved disciple. As, he, that is Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he is blind? And Jesus said, it was neither this man that sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. The works of God here are the glorious works of God. Jesus said God's about to do something great and wonderful in this man's life so that you can understand the nature of the God of heaven. Now, Jesus gave instructions to this man. Jesus himself spit on the ground and with the dirt formed clay. And he rubbed this on the man's eyes and then he told the man to go to the pool of Siloam to wash his eyes and there he would find healing and sight. And so the man left, was taken to the pool of Siloam, and there he washed his eyes. Do you know what happened? He saw. He gained his sight again. He was blind before. He had sight after. Do you suppose the man believed Jesus when Jesus told him to cleanse the spittle from his eyes and he would be okay? I, he did what, God, what Jesus said. I think he had faith. Was he cleansed? Was he given sight at that instance? No. It wasn't until he obeyed. It wasn't until he did what Jesus said, until he demonstrated that faith. And he went to the pool of Siloam, and the water washed off the, uh, the clay from his eyes, and he saw. The line of demarcation for this blind man was this water in the pool of Siloam. Was there something special about that pool? Was the power in that water? No, not at all. The power is in God. It is the operation of God that gave this man sight. The God who created us, who gives us sight at birth. For this man, he did not have sight at birth. Nothing was working naturally. But God, the supernatural God of heaven, recorded in the Bible, cleansed him. And the dividing line was that he was in the pool of Siloam. Our final slide, <clears throat> excuse me, well, next to the last slide anyway. What do all of these dividing lines have in common? Well, actually, you're looking at it. What you see under this sign is water. All of these dividing lines involved water. And as we go to the next slide, we see that there is a dividing line for salvation today, for us to be spared, for us to go from a bad state to a good state. And that is the dividing line uh, of baptism. Now, this is controversial for a lot of people. And I'm not trying to contend that the water in and of itself has special power. I know better than that. We drain our baptistry periodically and we fill it with fresh water. It's just city water from the city of, Do of, of Dover, Ohio. But what we find is there must be faith and there must be obedience. For Noah, he obeyed and was saved from the flood. For Israel, 
They obeyed God and they walked, marched across the Red Sea and were spared from Pharaoh and his army. For Naaman, we find that he did what God said and the Jordan River, he dipped seven times and was cleansed of his leprosy. For the blind man, that dividing line of obedience was when he used the waters of the pool of Siloam. So what we find out from this is there is a dividing line. In the New Testament, in the book of Acts, we read of a number of people who came to God for salvation. One example of a person who was saved is found in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch who had Philip preach to him. And he was baptized. As they went along, they said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, Peter told the people uh, that they were still in sin. But that when they interrupted his sermon uh, and asked him what they needed to be saved, he said, Repent and be baptized. They already believed. The Samaritans of Acts 8 were baptized. Saul, later who became Paul the Apostle, he was baptized, Acts 9, 22, and repeated again in chapter 26. Cornelius in Acts 10, the first Gentile convert, was baptized. Lydia in Acts 16. Christmas in Acts 18. The, the, the disciples of John the Baptist, who realized they had been baptized of their own baptism, with John the Baptist need to be baptized in Christ's baptism, they were baptized. All of these people realized there was a dividing line between being lost and being saved, and that the waters of baptism was a dividing line. What about you, my friends? Have you been baptized for the remission of your sins? If not, you need to be. You need to come to God and allow the operation of God on your heart cleanse you from sin. We're not saying that you're going to earn salvation by something that is done to you or by something that you do, but rather because you have faith and are obedient, God blesses you. He allows his grace to work upon you and he cleanses you of sin. But just as God throughout the history of his dealings with man has used water as a line of demarcation between the curse and the blessing, he still does that yet today. If you've not done that, we hope that you would contact us. Call the congregation at Wadsworth. Get a hold of David Kinney and let him study with you. And you can find out what it's like to be on the safe side of the line of demarcation. May God bless you in your study. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. Don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people, or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind too that in Noah's day there was a big flood and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey. In this world we have our troubles. Satan scares we must evade.
Jesus.